I'm not going to be able to get through everything today. So I was planning originally on recording something over the weekend. Then I, I realized that it's a, a lot more effective for me to actually cover the early portions of this lecture in class because it's important. And the trailing bits, uh, I will record a lecture of my own and uh, put them up by tomorrow. So that will not the final, like, final but it's probably not going to be very long, maybe half an hour or 40 minutes. Best case, OK? Uh, so here's a quick recap where we were, everything that we've done. Uh, we went through gradient descent and back propagation. Here is the basic formalism that we use for training the network. We have a loss function. The loss function is a function of the parameters of the network. And it is defined as the average divergence over a whole bunch of training samples. And uh, we uh, try to uh, find the parameters that minimize this loss. This loss has many components. The total loss, of course, is the term L. The summation and the division in front shows that you're performing averaging. The dive is actually the divergence function that quantifies the difference between the desired output and the actual output of the network. The f, the divergence function, is a, is a function of two terms. The first is the output of the network itself, f, which is where the parameters come in. So the parameters are nested inside the dive. And then d of x is the desired output of the network in response to the, in response to the uh, input x. And the manner in which we actually train the network, the loss function, again, we can compute the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters, which is simply going to be the average of the gradient of the divergences for the individual training instances. And uh, the actual optimization we perform when we minimize L of W is through gradient descent, where we use this iterative uh, walking against the gradient to uh, learn the parameters of the network. Now, before I continue over here, there's just one thing that I would like you to uh, keep in mind, that what we are actually trying to minimize is not the loss. So you would have some function, w. Here's the actual function that you want to minimize. And based on your current setting of the weights, you're going to have some other function. This is f. And this area quantifies the error between the two. And you're trying to learn the parameters that minimize this area. You're trying to where the error at any given point is quantified by the divergence. So really, you want to minimize the term you want to minimize is the expected value. Ideally, is going to be argument over W, the expected value of the divergence between f of xw and d of x. This is what we really want to perform. Keep that in mind, right? So now the gradient, of course, of the total loss is the average of the gradients of the individual instances, and that can be computed using back propagation, what we've seen so far. Now, the gradient descent, back prop and gradient descent. Back prop is, of course, not a problem. Back propagation computes derivatives for individual instances. But the problem with the gradient descent approach is that, first, we are minimizing a loss that relates to classification accuracy, but is not actually classification accuracy. The divergence isn't counting the number of errors you make. You have a proxy, and so it's and it's continuous valued. Yes. Sorry, just one question about that picture. When you draw uh, the actual function with respect to W, what is that? So there is we, we we mentioned this in several previous classes, right? There is an ideal function that we are actually trying to estimate, right. that that we that we are trying to approximate using our network. Our problem is that we don't know what this function is. But in the ideal case, what we would do is if we actually had the function, we would be trying to minimize the total divergence between what the network is computing and the function that you want to compute. Okay. So that function could be anything, right? We just don't know what it is. Um, but the actual function we are trying to approximate, that would be a function with respect to x. X, 
Oh, you are right. You are absolutely, you are absolutely correct. My mistake. Thank you. I make these mistakes. Thanks for catching it. Your name? Justin. Justin. Thanks, Justin. Yes. Uh, so uh, now, uh, now again, minimizing the loss is expected to, but not guaranteed to minimize the classification error, right? So again, even simply minimizing the loss is hard enough. We found that uh, uh, the, uh, when you use gradient descent, the step size actually affects whether you're going to, the algorithm is going to converge or not. So in the for, uh, for example, if you look at the top row, if you have a step size which converges, which makes the solution converge some, somewhat cleanly for one uh, uh, eccentricity of, uh, of your uh, loss function, which is the figure to the left, for a steeper eccentricity, the same, same step size can make things blow up. On the other hand, a step size that actually makes the solution converge in the second case is going to end up resulting in extremely slow convergence in the first case. So the loss function, again, is a function of many weights and biases. It has different eccentricities with respect to different weights. A fixed step size for all the parameters in the network can result in the convergence of one weight while causing a divergence of the other guy. Convergence with respect to one weight but causing a divergence with respect to the other guy, right? So we found that just having a fixed step size is a problem. Uh, solution, again, this is a recap of everything we've done so far. You can try to normalize the curvature in all directions. Uh, so this we did using second order methods like Newton's method, but they require inversion of giant Hessian matrices, so that's infeasible. You can try to treat each dimension independently, like R prop or quick prop. It works, but ignores dependencies between dimensions and sometimes can result in unexpected behavior and can still be too slow, too slow. And so we came up with momentum methods. This is where we're sort of closed off, right? Now, the principle of momentum methods uh, was that if you had some behavior like the left case, where the function was sort of converging smoothly, then you know that you're not oscillating and going off that you're not diverging, and so you can actually increase the step size. Whereas you have something like the situation on the left where you begin oscillating across the bowl, then you can immediately figure out that you're oscillating across the bowl by looking at the sign of your derivative. It's gonna keep flipping. And if that happens, then you want to shrink your step size. And that resulted in the, uh, uh, so uh, if you did something of that kind in a function in, in, in the, in the uh, loss minimization framework, you would find that for the figure to the extreme right, it's going to stretch the, increase the step size along the vertical direction, it's going to shrink it along the horizontal direction, it's going to result in a better, better convergence. So uh, we saw two different variants of this. The first, of course, was the momentum method. In the momentum method, you take a step and then you'd, you would compute the gradient at the current step, so you compute a step along the gradient, but then extend it in the direction of the current step itself. So you maintained a running average of all the steps that you had taken so far. And you updated based on the running average rather than just the current gradient. The advantage of doing this was that you are basically taking an expectation, you're computing the average because you're doing the running average. You're basically averaging all the past steps. So you are updating based on the expected value of the step in each direction. And if it's oscillating in some direction, you'd expect the expected value to, to sort of cancel out to zero. And if it's sort of continuing in, one, in some direction, you'd expect the expected value to stay consistent. You can increase the step size. So again, keep in mind that you're act, when you're using momentum methods, you're basing it on the expected value of step size, right? So if you have something like this, then in this direction, here it's a positive, here it's a negative by this much, here it's a positive by this much, here it's a negative by this much, these two would cancel out. These two, for example, are going to result in, if you just had these four steps, the average of these is going to be something this long. Right, you're only looking at the expectations. Now, uh, Nestorov's method was just an opti more optimal version of 
the standard momentum where you first took the extended step and then computed the gradient as opposed to doing the opposite. And it's easy to see why it's more optimal because you want to compute the gradient with respect to where you would end up as opposed to ending up where your, where your gradient tells you to go. So uh, all of this is stuff from the past. We're going to come cover a bunch of uh, new topics today, incremental updates, and we're going to revisit trend algorithms and look at generalization. And we're going to look at some tricks of the trade, including divergences, activations, and normalizations. So first, let's look at this business of incremental updates. Now, here's what we wanted to do. Let's go back to this function. We had, thank you again, Justin. <laughs> this is a mistake I would, that would have persisted. Here was a function that we actually wanted to estimate, but you don't have the value of the function everywhere, right? So what we did was took samples of, the, of input output pairs at various locations. And if you have a current estimate of the, uh, and uh, we tried to compute a function that would actually fit these samples. Now, if you have a current estimate, of the function, remember, the current estimate of the function, when you, if, if the current estimate of the function is like so, you want to minimize this error, this, this shaded area, but you cannot actually compute the shaded area. So what you will do instead is to compute the average length of the error at these samples. And you use the average length of the error at the samples as a proxy for the shaded area. Now your initial estimate is almost certainly going to be wrong everywhere. So every one of those lengths is going to be non-zero. And, so you, you, and you're trying to minimize the average length. What we are doing, what gradient descent is doing is considering the divergences at every single point, right? So it's trying to correct the error in theory at every single point. So it would try, it may not succeed, but it's going to try to reduce the error, increase the function value in the first two locations, decrease the function value in the next two locations, and then increase it again in the fifth location. Basically, it's, trying to, it's going to try to adjust the function at every single training point to reduce the error between uh, what you have and what you want, and that's going to give you a modified function. And then again, you would repeat the whole thing. You're going to compute the gradient across the entire data set, all, all of your instances, so which means that you have uh, uh, errors at every single location, and uh, wait, where are my TAs? Do I see any of my TAs here? No, so, uh, Rohit, can you actually monitor Piazza? Thank you. So, we are going to try to uh, minimize the, uh, again, we are going to try to make adjustments at every single training point to correct the error, right? And that's going to give you some new function, and you'd keep doing this. Now, what happens here? We, what we are really trying to do is to simultaneously minimize the error at every single training point. So what this means is that when you're trying to come simultaneously minimize the error at every single training point, you have to process every single training instance, go over the entire collection, and make adjustments. And that means you have to wait until all of your data points have been seen before you make a single adjustment. Now here's an alternative. You can begin uh, making adjustments at fun one, one location at a time. So you can think of it this way. I have some function, and I have, some, I have a handkerchief that I'm trying to fit to the function. It starts off with some you know, unnecessary shape. So I begin sort of pushing or push, pulling the whole entire handkerchief all at once to fit the function, that's one way of doing it. Or I can sort of keep picking and prodding at individual locations in the handkerchief, but then I can't just pull it a whole lot and make this fit because it's going to change the entire shape. I gotta change, push it and prod it, prod it by tiny, uh, tiny bits and adjust it locally to make the, make the uh, shapes fit, right? So you can actually, you could actually sort of make, uh, adjust the function at one training point at a time, like, uh, here you find that at that location, the function is totally, uh, totally off the yellow bar, so you would push it, and that's going to push the dotted line up to the red line. And then you pick some other training point, and here you find that it's still too low, so then 
you would push it up at that point. Then you pick a third training point, and here you find that the function is too high, so you're gonna push it down at that point. You do it one point at a time. And if you keep doing this in this incremental uh, value, or, or incremental manner, so long as you keep the individual adjustments small, and this is important. You have to keep the individual adjustments small because again, think of the handkerchief simile. If I just try to make the whole thing fit at one point, it's going to muck up the shape everywhere else. So you just make local adjustments at each point. And if you do this carefully one point at a time, you know from experience you've obviously done these things with trying to shape threads to curves and such like, you can keep pushing it, right? You don't actually try to push the entire thread all at once, you keep pushing it at local locations. If you do it slowly enough, it's eventually gonna fit. And eventually you'd have gone over all of your training points if you do this carefully and made adjustments everywhere. So this is this increment and uh, you can potentially make greater overall adjustment if you just, than if you just uh, try to adjust all of your training points all at once because when you, when you poke the individual points separately. And we'll see why this could be the case. Although uh, there's going to be a little bit of divergence between the theory and your intuition. So this mechanism is what we call, this incremental update mechanism is what we call stochastic gradient descent, where you're adjusting at one, one point at a time. And uh, the uh, uh, pseudocode sort of explains this. Observe that I'm looping over all of the training instances and we are making updates to the functions, to the parameters after each training instance. Now, when you're doing this, the iterations can make multiple passes over the entire data. So we've got nomenclature. When you make a single pass over the entire data, we're gonna call it an epoch. Within an epoch, you're going to have many observations. You would make an adjustment for every observation. So if you have T training instances, you would be making T updates within an epoch. So going back to the pseudocode, uh, the outside do is looping over the entire data. So the outside do is looping over epochs. Now the uh, yellow block, the highlighted block is a single epoch. It's one pass over the entire training data. But within, in the entire tra within each epoch, you're making T updates to the parameters, right? Now there's some caveat here. You can't just do it any odd how. You have to be careful. So consider a situation where I have training data of this kind. I have a bunch to the extreme left and a bunch to the extreme right. And if I'm sort of going through my data left to right in sequential manner, and, make, make, and keep me, if I keep making my adjustments, what will happen? In the beginning, it's, all, it's going to see a bunch of overestimates. So it's going to push all of those down. Now if my function is naturally restricted to being a curve, then when I push this down, the result is going to be that the right side is going to swing up. And then, my sequential uh, uh, processing of the data is going to hit the data points to the right. It's going to push those down. And the data is going to swing right back. So the uh, problem is if you loop through the, and then if I go back and loop through the data in the same order, now the whole thing is going to go back up and then it's going to go back down. So when, if you loop through the samples in uh, cyclic order, in, the, in deterministic cyclic order, uh, or deterministic order, you can end up with cyclic behavior of this kind, where the function just keeps oscillating around. So uh, the, uh, you know, like so. So in order to avoid this, we must make them sort of go randomly to get more convergent behavior. So what you might want is to randomly pick data points, and then maybe you would end up pushing something to the left down a bit, and then, you, then, then you, the next random choice is going to be possibly to the right, and then you push that guy up a bit. And so you would actually sort of begin making corrections. And by being random, you ensure that you don't get cyclic behavior because you're sort of picking things all over the place. Now this random selection of data points is extremely critical because if you don't do it, this cyclic behavior will almost certainly emerge in most settings of your problems. So to update our pseudocode, this is what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to randomly permute your training data between epochs, just to make sure that each time you pass through the training data, you're going through them in a different order, in a different randomized order, right? Uh, so, story so far. In any gradient descent optimization problem, presenting training data instances incrementally can 
potentially be more effective than presenting them all at once, provided the training data are presented in random order. This is the stochastic gradient descent. The term stochastic comes from the fact that you're actually randomly training, selecting your training samples. And this is nothing special to neural networks. This is for any kind of function optimization, but particularly in our, in our, in our context, it works really well for neural networks. So why would you expect this to cast incremental update to work better and under what conditions? I mean, intuitions apart. So we're still going to sort of work with intuitions, but try to get a little stronger handle on the problem. Let's look at the first question. There are two here. Why will it work and under what conditions? Uh, let's consider the why. And I'm going to give you a simplistic explanation, which is often given. I'm going to look at an extreme example. Now, remember, when I compute the average, uh, that should have been an L, the, when I compute the uh, average gradient over all of my training instances, of the, of the divergences for all of my training instances. So when I'm compute the, computing the gradient of the loss with respect to my parameters, I'm averaging the gradient for the divergences for each of my training instances, but all of my training instances are different. So their gradients are all going to point in different directions. So you have, if you have a function of this kind, the gradients are likely going to look like what you have in the top right. Each of my training instances has a gradient which is a different length pointing in a different direction. You're averaging the lot. And that gives you the resulting divergence shown by the red line, and that is the direction in which you're going to be adjusting your function. But now, let me give you an extreme case. All of my training points are the same due to some bizarre reason. So now if I have T training points and every one of them is the same, then what happens? All of my training instances, all of my divergences are point pointing in exactly the same direction. The average is going to be exactly the same as uh, as uh, the divergence, the, the uh, divergence for the the gradient for any one training instance, and as a result, if you performed a batch update, after having processed your entire training data, you got exactly as much information as you you would have got if you had just processed only one training data, training instance. Whereas if you kept updating your parameters after each training instance, then in, when in one pass through the training data, you would have made T updates. So you're going to get a lot more bang for the buck, T times the bang for the buck in, potentially, uh, if you're making incremental updates over your training instances. Now this obviously holds if all of them are exactly the same training instance. But then you can, you can imagine that this is also going to be the case if all of the training instances are very close, right? Again, if you're going to be averaging and making a way, waiting to average all of them, then effectively you're, you're going to get the equivalent of just having seen one of these training instances or maybe the average training instance. Whereas if you incrementally, if you made updates after seeing every single instance, you're going to get T times the corrections. And as the data become increasingly diverse, the benefits of incremental updates decrease, but they do not entirely vanish. Even in the limiting case, you're going to get some benefits. Now exactly what benefits, we will see that in a bit, right? Questions, anyone? Yeah. So um, in theory, shouldn't we sample the mini batches? Um, we haven't yet gotten to mini batches. Okay, but uh, sample each data point um, with the spacing? So, uh, uh, in practice, you don't want to because you're just basically going to, in a single epoch, you're sort of wasting your computation. But in theory, yes. You're speaking of literally random sampling. It's stochastic. Right. So now, we get some intuition of how this works, why this works. And any intuition you might have formed based on this picture is actually going to be a fairly good intuition. But then, what are the considerations? and how well does it work? Now, this, one, cons one significant consideration is the learning rate. If I have a whole bunch of training points, 
And if I'm incrementally making an adjustment after each training point, now consider this, I have this collection of training points, the average function, they're following a linear trend. If I'm trying to fit a line, that red line over there is the optimal uh, linear regression for the entire set of training points. On average, it's the best case, but what happens for any individual training instance? For any individual training instance, it's absolutely wrong, right? So when you begin considering individual training instances one at a time, your current function is almost certainly always going to be wrong. And so if you're making corrections for individual training instances, you're always going to find something to, something to correct even though you've already found the optimal solution. So how does this sort of, uh, uh, how does this interact with the fact that we think that making incremental solutions can actually give you, a, give you uh, an answer? And this has to do with your step sizes. If the step size that you use to make your correction remains constant, then clearly you're always going to be chasing your tail because for the latest training instance, you're almost certainly going to be wrong. As time passes, you want the step sizes to shrink. You must, you must shrink the learning rate with iterations to prevent this. And so correction for individual instances uh, must be such that as you keep going through the data, eventually the learning rate keeps shrinking and becomes small enough that uh, the corrections are going to be uh, negligible. So basically here again is your uh, gradient uh, descent pseudocode. I have changed it a little bit. And how so first there's your random permutation again, but observe that I'm keeping track of how many updates we've made so far and the step size is being adjusted after each update. And exactly how must the step size be adjusted? Now I made this statement earlier that in the generic case, you really want when you don't, when you have non-convex functions. For convex functions, having a fixed step size works just fine. In the generic case, when you have non-convex functions, we said that you want your gradient, your step size to shrink. Now I didn't actually make much of a, uh, I didn't actually uh, uh, give you much of a rationale behind it, but that becomes much more apparent when you're looking at something like stochastic gradient descent. The step sizes, the, the stochastic gradient descent can give you the correct solution, the optimal solution, but under a specific condition. That the step sizes allow you to explore the entire space, which means that the sum of the step sizes must be infinite. But at the same time, the step sizes shrink so that in the limit, eventually things become small enough that you're not making adjustments and chasing your tail. So, this again means that the sum of the squared step sizes must be finite, but the sum of the step sizes themselves must be infinite. And again, you can see the logic behind it. If I'm in some space, and if I have an upper bound on the derivative, whatever the alpha, then if summation, each step size, the, the uh, largest value for any step size is going to be a, magnitude of alpha times eta k, right? And so the total correction is going to be k equals one to infinity alpha times eta k, assuming they're all positive. And so if I can pull this alpha out, so if this is a finite number, and let's say this finite number is some c, then the maximum correction I'm going to be able to make from my starting point is going to be alpha c even after infinite steps, which means that if I have some initial point over here, if this is my initial estimate, I'm never going to be able to find parameters outside this ball. So to avoid this, you want the step sizes to sum to infinity. At the same time, you want the steps to shrink. So you want the sum of the squared step sizes to be finite and the fastest converging series that satisfies both requirements is one over k. And pretty much most learning schedules that you will see when you actually do your homework, homeworks or practical implementations have some variant of one over k. It's not exactly one over k. You could be having the same step size for a while and then you reduce it and you have the same step size for a while and so on. But it's going to have some f format of this kind. What you will have is that they, they eventually uh, shrink to uh, zero. Now, you can define the convergence for all of these gradient descent rules. 
Let me erase this. I'm going to need this space. Okay. And the convergence can be defined in terms of how far the value of, of the loss function is from the optimal loss, the minimal loss that you can get for this particular network. And using the optimal learning rate, you will find that for strongly convex functions, the theory says that if you use stochastic gradient descent, then the uh, convergence follows 1 over k. Now, which is you're going to, after k iterations, you're going to be 1 over k away from the optimal solution. Meaning eventually, after infinite iterations, you're going to be at the optimal solution. But this is actually very slow convergence, if you think about it. Now, this is for strongly convex functions. If you have generically convex functions, but they're not strongly convex, then it turns out that you need a learning rate of 1 over square root of k, and the convergence rate is only 1, only, uh, one over square root of k. But there's, a diff there, there's something to remember, that in any single pass through the data, you're actually making t updates, as opposed to, so here k is the number of updates, not number of passes through the data. Now let's compare this to batch gradient descent. In batch gradient descent, if you have a strongly convex function, then the rate of convergence is c raised to k, where c is less than 1. So you can see that this gets to the correct solution exponentially fast, although we call it linear convergence because we're speaking in terms of logs, right? And so to get to within an epsilon of, a, uh, of, the, correct, uh, of the optimum, the number of iterations you're going to need is order of log of 1 over epsilon. Whereas for stochastic gradient descent, you're going to need order of 1 over epsilon. So it's much, and the log obviously greatly reduces the number of iterations you're going to require to get to the solution. That's for strongly convex functions. And for generically convex functions, the iterations to epsilon can, is order of 1 over epsilon if you're using batch descent. So uh, the, for strong, the kind of convergence you get with stochastic gradient descent for strongly convex functions is comparable to uh, the, the convergence that you get for functions that are not strongly convex when you use, when you use batch descent. So obviously you, you, would, you would expect batch descent to be much, uh, much faster than uh, stochastic gradient, yes. So strongly convex, it's there, uh, this is there in the, in the slides uh, a couple of lectures ago. A strongly convex function is something that sits within a quadratic bowl. And uh, a convex function is basically a bowl. So you can have convex functions where you can put a quadratic bowl inside the function, which means it's not as fast as a quadratic. And other functions which sit inside a quadratic, which sit inside a quadratic bowl, mean, meaning it's at least as convex is a quadratic function. Take a look at the slides, right? We have nice figures and everything in there. Anyway, so here's a simple SGD example. This is for k-means. This is for, not for neural networks. Uh, now, the red line is when you're using uh, SGD, and the green line is what you get when you're using batch, batch uh, 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 you know, batch updates. Firstly, observe that SGD converges much faster than batch updates. So SGD actually, the number of training cycles that you require over here is just one CPU second, whereas to get to the, to, for the error loss to taper off, it took 100 seconds for the batch updates. So that's a good thing. But the flip side is the error is much higher. The actual solution it found is much worse. But then there's a bar. What are these error bars? If I rerun with different initializations, I'm going to end up in different points. And you find that the error bars are a lot greater, much, much bigger for SGD than for batch updates, which means that even when it converges, you can expect different solutions of different quality for SGD than you would for batch updates, where you expect the solutions to be much more consistent. So why is this the case? Now remember, this is just uh, the recap of what I have over here. This is the function that you're trying to minimize. 
you are trying to minimize the expected value of the divergence between the output of the function and the true desired output at each point, right? Expected over the entire domain of the input. So this is really what we are trying to minimize. In the generic case, g of x is the function you're trying to, for, to model. f is your network. You're trying to minimize the expected value of the divergence between the two. This is a statistical expectation. What we are really minimizing is the loss, which is the average divergence over a bunch of training points. So our loss is 1 over n, summation i equals 1 to n, divergence of f of xi, I'm just using a shorthand notation, right? If, but then if I take the expected value of the loss, that's going to be 1 over n, summation i, expected value of the divergence. Now the expected value of the divergence doesn't depend on the specific instance. If I think of my, my collection of n training samples as, you know, randomly chosen. So this is simply going to be 1 over n times n times expected value of divergence. These n's cancel out, correct? So what this means is that the expected value of my loss function is actually the actual objective that I would like to minimize. So why do we actually use this loss? Uh, I mean, I mean uh, why does this empirical loss actually make sense? It makes sense because in expectation, it's really the function that we want to minimize. So we can hope that if you minimize this loss, that guy too is kind of reduced, if not minimized. Now this is hope. There are no real guarantees. It turns out there are all kinds of bounds. But uh, yeah, but uh, uh, the expectation is that the function that you actually minimize must, at least in expectation, it must be the same as the function that you are, that you would like to minimize, right? So the empirical risk is an unbiased estimate of the expected loss. What do I mean by unbiased? It means that my ex the expected value of my loss is exactly what I would like to minimize. So there's no difference between the two. It's unbiased, which means that minimizing this could potentially also minimize the other guy, right? Yes. So, um, what is the left -hand side expectation over the left-hand side expectation is over all of the training points, so over, the, so over, over, over P of X. Uh -huh. So, um, like relating to the previous question, this only works if the sample uh, with displacement. Right? Yeah. So then, why does it, uh, why do we sample without displacement in practice, and why does it work? Like There's a little gap between practice and uh, and uh, uh, you know theory, in in the sense that we are also trying to make maximum uh, utilization of all of your uh, training data, and that's basically why we do it. That's it. Right. In fact, the difference between uh, sampling with and without replacement is actually quite small when your training data is sufficiently large. So there's a, there are the theorems, and then, then there's what, what we actually do. The bounds for sampling without replacement are somewhat, the proofs are somewhat different. But then here is the more important thing, right? Now look at this guy. This is the average of the divergences over many training instances, right? So what is the variance of the loss? What do I mean by the variance of the loss? Every time I take n training samples, I'm going to get a different set of training samples. I can compute the average loss over all of these guys, right? This average loss is going to be different depending on the training set. So there's a variance across different sample size, samples. What is the variance of this guy? If you actually work it out now, if you assume that all of your training data, training instances are independent, then this is the variance of the average of n samples. So the variance itself is simply going to be the average of the variances for each of these guys. And now, I don't know if I can show this board, I can't. Simply there, depending on the fact that if I have uh, x hat equals 1 over n summation i xi, where all the xi's are identical and identically distributed and independent, iid, uh, 
then x hat equals x1 over n plus x2 over n and so on, right? So the variance of x hat is simply going to be the sum of their variances, which is going to be the variance of x1 over n plus the variance of x2 over n and so on, which is going to be 1 over n squared variance of x1 plus 1 over n squared variance of x2 and so on. But the way all of these variances are identical because the x's are identically distributed. There are n such terms. So this is going to be 1 over n squared times n times variance of x. The n's cancel out, right? So it's, so here uh, I'm just writing x on the board, but this is any random variable. And so in our case, the divergences are the terms that we are interested in. And so the variance of this loss is actually 1 over n, the variance of the divergence for the individual training instances, right? What this means is that over different samples, you're going to get uh, different divergences, but the variance across the divergences is going to depend on the number of samples. Now, if I'm performing stochastic gradient descent at in any individual update, I'm trying to just minimize the divergence for one training instance. So at any single sample, the loss that I'm trying to minimize is simply the divergence for a single training instance. So the expected loss is the expectation of this divergence, which is simply going to be the expected of the divergence, this term here, which is exactly the same as this guy that we were trying to minimize, right? So what this means is that even when I'm performing stochastic gradient descent, the actual loss that I'm trying to minimize at each step is an unbiased estimate of my true objective function. The real problem lies with the variance. And how is that? If you look at this, what is the variance of divergence of this loss function? It's simply the variance of the divergence, one times the variance of the divergence, right? So the variance over here is simply going to be the variance of the divergence. Now compare this with the earlier case where we had 1 over n times the variance of the divergence. So in the batch divergence case, in the batch, in the batch update case, the variance of the loss function that you're trying to minimize is going to be 1 nth of the variance of the loss function that you would be minimizing if you were performing stochastic gradient descent. Now all of this may not make a lot of sense in terms of just abstract math, but then let's look at some figures to see how this works. So here, the blue curve is the function that you're trying to approximate. The red curve is the approximation that you get at a current estimate for W. And you want to minimize the area of the shaded, the, the shaded area, right? Now, the heights of the shaded regions at each point represent the point by point error, basically the divergence, right? And we want to find the W that minimizes the shading area, shaded area, except that we don't have the entire function. So we are collecting a bunch of samples. And we are computing the average heights of those blue lines and using that as a proxy for the shaded area. Correct? So now given this, what happens? The average length uh, that you get for these, uh, for these lines going, is going to depend on the positions of these training samples. So if I have this first collection, right, of lines, now suppose these were my training samples, then that's going, that's going to give you one set of one average. But in a, say in a different experiment, so look over here. I'm where I have some samples from the red regions, I have some samples from the blue regions, I get some uh, expectation for the error, right? Suppose I have a completely different set of samples. This set of samples is entirely from the blue regions. So if I only got these training samples, I'm going to, be, I'm going to get the idea that I should reduce the value of the function everywhere. Or uh, is this case, in this case, increase the value of the function everywhere, which would be wrong for the red regions, right? Just by getting a different set of training samples, I've got an entirely different idea of how, how, how I must correct the function. Or if I got something like this, then I'm going to get 
a different idea of how I must adjust the function in order to make it a better approximation. So different training samples, there are different sets of training samples are going to give me different ideas of what the actual error between the true function and the current approximation is. And so our idea of our, uh, our uh, uh, notion of how to correct the function is going to depend on the locations of the samples. Now how can we make this more robust to the locations of the samples? Anybody? Pardon me? Hmm? Normalization, no. Normalization is still not going to change the positions of the samples, right? You still have the same error. The only real way you can do this is to have lots more samples. So if I have many more samples, then the more and more, the more samples I have, the better I, my approximation really is going to be, or the better the idea, it's, uh, the better uh, idea it's going to give me about how to adjust the function. And so basically what we say, uh, when we say that the loss, the variance of the loss is inversely proportional to the number of samples, is basically telling you this, that if I add more and more samples, then if, if I, then the uh, difference in how I actually compute the loss across different sample sets is going to be smaller when I have more samples, right? But then, let's take the ext extreme case. Suppose I have only one sample. This is what happens with SGD. If my one sample happens to be at that one point, it's going to tell me everything is fine, the world is fine, don't bother. On the other hand, if my sample happens to fall here, it's going to tell me the function really must, the value of the function must really increase. If it happens to fall here, it's going to tell me the value of the, it's going to tell me the value of the function must increase a lot. Here it's going to tell me the value of the function must decrease a lot. So as a result, when you have only one sampling point, when you're sampling the function at only one point, your idea of the actual error can swing extremely wildly. The variance is very large. And that sort of explains what's happening over here. When you're performing SGD, you're across different runs, you get different solutions, and those solutions can vary quite widely. Whereas with batch gradient, those, those solutions are going to have much smaller variation, right? So SGD uses the, uh, the gradient from only one sample at a time, and it's consequently high variance but also provides significantly quicker updates because you are computing T updates. And if the data are not randomly scattered, but if they are clumped, then really SGD is going to give you a much better solution for that data instance, right? So is there a good medium? Well, that's where your mini batch update comes in. And the mini batch update, you adjust the function at small randomly chosen subsets of trunk points, keeping the adjustment small, exactly as before. And if the subset covers the training set, then eventually you're going to cover, see all of your training data. So you know, if across the subsets you cover your training set, eventually you're going to see all of your training points. So for instance, instead of looking at all six points, in the first, ba first batch you may be taking these three points. You make corrections for these three points, which gives you some correction. Then in the next step, you take randomly select three other points. You're going to make corrections for these three other points, and that's going to give you some other corrections and so on. So the, uh, the uh, uh, pseudocode, you can see how this works out. It's exactly the same as for SGD, except that now you wait for an entire batch of updates. You compute the average derivative over the batch and use that in your updates. You still have to have this business of making sure that your uh, step size shrinks. So now why would mini batches work? You know, why would you expect mini batches to work better than uh, SGD? Now, the batch loss for mini batches is going to be the average of the divergences across the uh, mini batch, right? What is the expected value of this batch loss? The expected value of the batch loss is still, some, you know, the Bs cancel out. It's still going to be the expected value of the divergence itself. So as a result, the batch loss is a Unbi is an unbiased estimate of the actual objective that you're trying to minimize. Now, this doesn't make it, the, 
this holds true for you know, stochastic gradient, mini batches, and for full batch updates. Where the kicker is, is in the variance. So if you look at the variance of this loss, this variance is going to be the variance of the divergence divided by B, which is the mini batch size. And so the difference between, you know, SGD, you had a scale factor of one. For batch, you had a scale factor of one over N. And for mini batch, you had a scale factor of one over B, right? And if you plot this as a function of, you know, batch size, let's say this is N, this is one, you're going to find this is one. Let's say, let's say this is one. You're going to find that this falls off very fast, right? So basically the difference in variance between a mini batch and a full batch update is not very much. At the same time, the mini batch gives you many updates over a single uh, pass over the entire training data. So uh, now there is a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, hand waving over here in the sense that if you actually look at the convergence rate, then the, uh, for convex functions, not strongly convex, generically strong convex functions, convergence rate for SGD is uh, the order of one over square root of K. For mini batches, it's one over B times square root of B times K. The one over K term doesn't really matter, right? So you're, this, because the denominator is increasing, it would look like the mini batches are converging much faster. Right? The problem really is that within each mini batch, you are going to have your processing B instances. So the actual computation, it actually ends up that in terms of CPU cycles, mini batches actually end up being slower than batches, than stochastic gradient, because although across iterations it's much faster, each iteration is going to take B times the time. That's where vector processing comes in. If you begin throwing your GPUs and such like at your processing, the B factor in computation basically goes away. And then the convergence is much faster. So if you actually look at the real experiments, here's what you get. The green line was batch descent, red is stochastic gradient, and the blue is the mini batch. And you can see the mini batch, it's not as quick as SGD, but it actually gets to the real solution. It has very low variance and gives you essentially almost the same solution as, uh, as uh, full batch, but orders of magnitude faster, right? So now in all of these, those plots are actually about showing you the overall training loss. But in reality, when you're actually performing your computation, you're never computing the loss over your entire training set after making the updates. You're only computing the loss over the current instance or the mini batch. So, so if you want to make plots like these, it's going to be quite impossible unless you're willing to waste or burn a lot of CPU just for the you know, sake of educating yourself. So more estimately, more typically we estimate the loss as divergence or classification error on some held out set or by maintaining some kind of a uh, running average over the past several batches. But you get the idea, the distinction between SGD full batch and mini batch and the trade-offs, right? So in practice, training is generally performed using mini batches. The mini batch size itself is a hyperparameter that must be optimized. Why so? Because we've seen that the variance in your loss depends on the mini batch size, one over B. And uh, for depending on the specific problem that you're trying to solve, there's going to be greater and your initial estimate too, there's going to be greater or lesser sensitivity to this particular variance. The convergence depends on the learning rate. So uh, standard techniques, you fix the learning rate till the error plateaus and reduce it by a fixed factor and so on. Again, make, observe that this convert this uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 satisfies the requirement that the sum of the squared step sizes is finite. And now the requirement that the sum of the step sizes itself is infinite is never really a practical requirement because you're never really going to explore the infinite space your data tend to be restricted. So that's something we tend to be a little more cavalier about. Now, 
You can also have adaptive updates where the learning rate itself is determined as part of the estimation. Now, and so, the story so far, SGD presents training instances one at a time and can be more effective than full batch training. For SGD to converge, the learning rate must shrink sufficiently rapidly with iterations. SGD estimates have higher variance than batch estimates. Mini batch updates operate on batches of instances at a time. Estimates have lower variance than SGD, but convergence rate is theoretically worse than SGD in terms of CPU time, not in terms of iterations. And so we can, we can take this, exploit this gap between CPU times versus iterations by performing vector operations and, uh, and uh, uh, techniques such as using your, uh, your GPU, right? Now, convergence depends on the learning rate. The simple technique, you know, you fix a learning rate till the error plateaus and so on, right? Advanced methods, you use ad adaptive updates where the learning rate itself is determined as part of the estimation. So let's revisit trend algorithms. Uh, we've seen the momentum method. Updates are obtained using a running average of the gradient. We've seen this, right? Exactly how the momentum method works. So you, at each point, the actual step size is going to be some linear combination of the step, the previous step, and, and the current gradient. So uh, you can also use this with SGD. When you're using it, with, using it with SGD, you're gonna be making a lot more corrections. But the momentum method still works. It turns out using things like momentum is going to be a little, uh, somewhat more important if you're doing SGD as opposed to batch, because uh, the SGD and mini batch gradients tend to have, a, have higher variance. The losses have higher variance, the gradients have higher variance. Also, also because you're sampling the data, which means that uh, uh, something that smooths out these variations is going to be important. Right? Uh, so here's a, uh, just some pseudocode, but let's get on. Same thing with Nestor's accelerated gradient. In Nestor's method, you first extend the current step and then compute the gradient. You would do the same thing with SGD as well. Nothing really changes. It's still going to be in principle, in principle it's still going to be more optimal than the basic momentum method. And once again, it's going to give you the same property that it sort of smooths out the oscillations that occur, particularly with these stochastic methods, right? So uh, here is uh, Nestor's method. Anyway, moving on. Now, here is something that in all of this that, did I actually write this? Somewhere, yeah. this block. When we were using momentum methods or things like Nesterov's method, what were we really doing? The steps in any particular direction, if they were, if they were sequentially converging, uh, you were if the steps were sequentially converging, you sort of made them longer, right? On the other hand, if the steps were oscillating, you took the average and it became very small or zero. So you were always looking at the expected value of the steps. You were averaging the steps in each direction to decide what happens. That's basically looking at the first moment of your steps, right? You're just looking at the average. Can we do better than that? Now remember that when you're doing things like SGD, SGD and mini batch, there's a greater variation the variance of the objectives is larger, the variance of the divergences is larger. You expect the entire algorithm to swing around a lot more than if you're just doing something like simple mini batch, right? Or simple batch uh, descent. And so having something that smooths out the steps is going to be a somewhat more important when you're doing SGD than if you're just doing batch descent. And uh, just looking at the first moment, maybe that's not sufficient. Maybe you can take one step more and look at the second moment of the steps. So what would the second, second moment of the steps be? Over here, if I look at this guy, look at the variance or the uh, mean squared value of the steps in the first case. It's going to be something, right? 
So now I have two things going on. They are all pointing in the same direction and I have some RMS value. Now here's the second case, they are oscillating around. Now suppose I have this versus this, right? If I'm looking at expectations for both of them, they're just the same. As far as I'm concerned, the positive and the negative are canceling out. But is that enough? Clearly in the second case, something is off, right? My step sizes should perhaps be shrunk more than just by what I would if I were only looking at the average in the second case. So we have a lot of methods that begin looking at the second or second order, the second moment terms for the uh, gradients when you actually decide how to adapt, uh, how, to, uh, how to make corrections to the current estimate. And these are things like RMS prop, add a grad, add a delta, add a, all of them are basically looking at the second moment instead of just looking at the first moment. So uh, ba the basic idea simply is still the same, right? Uh, if you look at, uh, this is just trying to explain what I just drew on the board. Uh, simple gradient and acceleration methods can still demonstrate oscillatory, and actually, actually let me skip the slide. Uh, the, uh, here's what we really want to do. We want to sort of not merely look at the average value, we also want to look at the second moment. We want to look at the variance or the mean squared value. Here, even though the average cancels things out, it cancels things out in the same way that it does over here. What I would like to say is that not only is the average canceling things out, but over here, the oscillation is not very much. So my step size is, you know, even if I have a, a moderately large step size, it's not really killing me, I'm managing to control it. In this case, the oscillation is wild. So this has large variance, large second moment. I want my step size itself to shrink in the second case. So we're going to sort of incorporate that into, this, into these variance normalized step sizes. Now here we are beginning to look at step sizes, not just the gradients, because the gradient is what it is, right? So the thing that you have control over is the step size. And so you're going to modify the step size. So here, for example, say the total movement in the Y component of the updates is high, but the movement in the X, total movement in the X components is lower. Although the X is going consistently, right? If I have something like this, this is the total movement in X, but the total movement is Y, Y is the summation of all of these variations, which is very large. So when things oscillate, you expect the total movement in the direction in which it's oscillating to be fairly large. So uh, we, what we would do is to sort of uh, use the same gradient-based updates as before, but we're going to shrink the step sizes in the directions where the oscillation is large, where there's a lot of movement, and you're going to sh expand the step sizes or shrink to a lesser degree in the directions in which the movement is much lesser. And this is according to their variation. So this is the basic notion behind these second order methods. Now, the simplest one is RMS prop. RMS prop only considers the second order term. It doesn't consider the expectation. So remember that we have two things going on over here. One is the expected value of these oscillations. The other is the actual variation itself, right? So RMS prop is only considering the second order, the, the, uh, the, uh, the variance, the second order movement. What you do is to try to keep a running average of the second moment. You basically try to compute the second moment of the derivatives in each direction. So you compute the squared, the squared derivative at any time. I'm going to write this as dou squared of d. d is, represents divergence. This is not the second derivative. It's the square of the derivative. I'm just using this as shorthand notation. The mean squared value of the derivative is going to be this guy, right? And if the mean squared value of the derivative in any direction is large, I'm going to shrink the step size. If it's small, I'm going to expand the step size. This was RMS prop. And so here is how the entire procedure works. You maintain a running av estimate of the mean squared value of the derivatives of each parameter which is just exactly a standard uh, running estimate function, right? And then the step size, this is just the standard gradient descent. Observe that I don't have a momentum term. 
All I'm doing is your standard gradient descent, except that the step size itself is proportional to the root mean squared value, inversely proportional to the root mean squared value. What that would do is naturally make the step sizes for something like this much smaller than the step sizes for something like this. But some very simple method, yes? So if you have um, like large arrows in the same direction, this will decrease the step size of that It will. It just means it's going to just uh, decrease the step size in every direction. It's pretty, it's, uh, uh, pretty uh, agnostic to the direction. But the point is that you expect, if you have something like a bowl and a convex function, you expect the, der the derivatives to keep becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. And so you don't expect the, uh, uh, the, that kind of wild swinging. And so reducing the step size is not a big deal. Whereas in the transverse direction, that's actually going to matter a whole lot. All that happens is that uh, in directions of great swing, the step sizes are shrunk more than in directions of consistent progress. But you will actually find out that this affects the convergence in your homeworks and your practical implementations, right? The problem with this is that it's not considering the expected value. It's only considering the second order moment, right? Now, what would be a better thing to do? So this is going to be your RMS prop. And the reason RMS prop is interesting is if you've actually gone through your slides, it's very similar to R prop. R prop has a step size that doesn't actually end up considering the value of the, de of the de uh, derivative at all. The R prop just has a step size which keeps getting scaled up and down. That's exactly what RMS prop is doing. I have the value of the derivative divided by the root mean squared value. All that remains in terms of magnitudes is the sign of the derivative. So RMS prop looks like a whole lot looks a whole lot like R prop, right? Now, and so if you actually plugged it into your uh, pseudocode, that's basically what it would look like. Now, obviously, the immediate obvious next step is why am I ignoring the expected value? I should be considering both the expected value and the second moment, should I not? And it turns out that Adam as the algorithm that actually does this. Adam has updates where uh, you actually maintain a running estimate of the mean derivative for each parameter. You, make a, you maintain a running estimate of the uh, mean squared derivative, and then you actually have a step size that looks at both the mean, but it's normalized by the uh, RMS value. So you're considering both the expected derivative and the uh, variance. This is basically momentum with normalization, right? This is Adam. Now Adam has an extra term over here. It turns out that if you just naively implement Adam, you get some, uh, you get some crazy behavior. So you have, some, you have this extra term. I'll leave you to figure out why this works, which makes sure that in the early iterations, things work properly. Uh, and because I'm kind of running out of time, and there are other variants to the same theme, like Adagrad, Ada Delta, Adamax. Now, all of these basically, uh, the, the actual variation is in how it treats the, uh, the uh, statistics of these derivatives. But the basic idea itself is very nicely captured between, uh, between RMS prop and Adam, in that when you actually have uh, these derivatives, which are the, the gradients which are swinging around, then you want to sort of capture the average trend, but you also want to make sure that you sort of scale down for things that swing a lot. And you want to catch, so, and so you want to account for both first and second moments or any other moments that you might think of. So you have all of these other solutions. Now, uh, there's a very nice uh, visualization for how these things work on uh, uh, this website down there. These guys have visualization for Beale's function and several others. And you can see how the various techniques actually work. This function has a uh, minimum out near that dark blue to the extreme right. It's shown to the left. And the figure to the right shows the equal value contours. You have SGD, you have momentum, you have Nestor's method, Adagrad, Ada Delta, RMS prop. It doesn't show Adam for some reason, but the Adagrad is going to uh, uh, behave somewhat like Adam. And you can see that 
well, the rest of them have gone home, but SGD is still sort of, it's not. Uh, the, momentum, the momentum techniques tend to swing out, observe. Whereas RMS prop actually gets there somewhat cleanly. And if you actually had Adam, it would get there even better, you know, even more cleanly in this particular problem. Or here is another uh, optimization. This is a nice little saddle and the direction of the optimum is obvious, right? And you can see Ada Delta just sort of zooms by, RMS prop is getting there, and poor old SGD is stuck somewhere on top. He's figured he's happy exactly where he is, right? <laughs> and it uh, gives you an idea. Now this is, a, this is another crazy function. Which one got, you know, which one won over here? The pink one, Nestroff's method won over here. So again, why this variation and the behavior of, the th of all of these? It really depends on the loss function. Right? If the loss function has crazy eccentricities, then you expect something that accounts for the swinging around to do a, uh, for both the, expected, the, the, uh, both the magnitude of the swinging around and the expected value of the swinging around to do better than something that accounts for only one of the two. And something that doesn't account for either is always going to be really bad, which is why SGD actually just hangs around and doesn't do anything very good. Uh, you can see RMS prop sort of accounts for the swinging, but Nestor's method, which, actually, which in this function, particularly because you don't have crazy eccentricities, uh, you'd expect something like Nestor's method to work really well, and so you can do that, it actually does that, right? Uh, in the uh, previous technique, whereas in the previous example, you do have some crazy eccentricities, so uh, you expect uh, Nestor's method to not necessarily be as good as something like RMS prop. At some point, it takes off. It finds that furrow, right? But otherwise, it sort of keeps bouncing around. And again, if you had something that accounted for both the expected value and the uh, second moment, it would, it would perform better still. So here's the story so far. Gradient descent can be sped up by incremental updates. Convergence is guaranteed under many conditions, but the learning rate must shrink with time. And SGD, which updates after each observation, can be faster than batch learning, but has high variance. Mini batch updates, where you update after batches, can be more efficient than SGD, and basically gives you some somewhat of a best of both worlds, provided your learning rates are carefully chosen. Convergence can be improved using smooth updates like RMS prop and other techniques, which actually look at the uh, the uh, the uh, distribution of the of the derivatives, right? So what I would have done next is to actually look at, I have five minutes, so let me look at one more topic. Let's look at things you have to consider, uh, you know, things like divergence and what are the tricks you can employ. So let's look at the divergence first, and the rest I will offload to the recorded lecture. Now here's the training, total training loss. It's the average divergence over the entire training set, right? Now. The convergence of gradient descent actually depends on the divergence. The better the behavior of the divergence function, the better it will, the uh, gradient descent will converge. Ideally, it must have a shape that results in a significant gradient in the appropriate, appropriate directions, and in the wrong directions, you should not have much of a component of the gradient at all. And this is what would guide the algorithm to the right solution. So if you have something, if you have these three uh, loss functions, the one to the left is a really terrible loss function. It's all, you know, peaky and has low, all kinds of local minima. You really don't want something like that. Now, both loss functions to the right are nice and smooth and have a global minimum. But the first guy is not great because initially it's very shallow. You're going to take forever to actually get to the valley where you want to be. And then once you're in the valley, it's so steep that you're likely to begin, you know, overshooting and swinging around. The best kind of loss function you want is the one to the right, where it's initially steep, and then as you get to the optimum, it sort of becomes shallow. So you can get there in a much more controlled manner, right? Now, the, so, and that's basically what this figure is showing. Something to the left, you're going to get behavior of this kind, although it is, it has a nice unique uh, low, uh, minimum, 
whereas the figure to the right is going to give you much cleaner convergence. Now let's look at our two most popular choices of divergence. One is the L2 divergence, and the other is the callback leibler divergence, right? Uh, we've seen this enough in your homeworks that you know exactly what each of these two are. Why choose L2 over KL or vice versa? Now, in many, many applications, the L2 divergence has actually long been favored. Anytime you do any kind of math, they always begin talking about the L2 divergence, unless you're looking at classifiers, right? So it's particularly useful when you're trying to perform regression, like you're trying to predict real-valued uh, real uh, outputs. But then if the intent is classification, the callback leibler divergence is actually more appropriate. And why is that? Now here's something surprising. I'm going to tell you that the L2 divergence is not convex. Right? Now L2 is, how do you define L2 again? It's a quadratic, right? The L2 is going to be one. The L2 divergence is F of X minus the, you know, D of X whole squared. But this half can be ignored, it's a scaling factor, right? This is a, this is a quadratic. So you expect quadratics, and what do quadratics look like? Quadratics have this nice bowl shape, right? There's nothing more convex than that. But here's the point. If I'm doing something like a logistic regression, so then I'm going to have a sigmoid or a softmax, which is basically the same thing as a logistic regression in many dimensions. Then I'm going to have a sigma of x, w, dx minus whole squared. What, now this is quadratic and nice and bowl like with respect to sigma, but what does it look like with respect to w? It turns out that when I look at the behavior with respect to w, the callback leibler divergence and the L2 look very different. The figure to the left is the L2, it looks like a flower. It is literally the function I told you that was a bad function, right? Whereas the KL divergence actually gives you this nice, beautiful ball. As a function of W, not as a function of the output of the uh, softmax, right? And so if you ever, so in answer to the question that I got a long time ago, why L2 and not, why KL and not L2 in these cases, here is the answer. If you are actually looking for uh, a classification problem where you uh, are trying to look for loss functions that are kind of convex in your, in your parameters, it turns out KL is actually convex and L2 is not. And just one final note, for L2 divergence, when you take a derivative of the L2 divergence, you're going to get this, which is, is basically the square of the error. The derivative is going to have an error times a Jacobian, right? So the actual error term itself ends up affecting your gradients, which is why we mentioned this earlier. When you compute your back propagation, the Y minus D term remains throughout, and so you end up calling it error back propagation. That's just only about nomenclature. Uh, and so to close the story so far, the choice of divergence both affects your ability to learn the network and the results that you will obtain from it. And in our particular problems, if you're trying to train a classifier, KL is probably going to behave better than L2. Stop here. And I don't think we have time for questions. If you have any, post them on Piazza, right? Would anybody on Piazza? Thank you.